Hello, everyone. It's yet another day of fresh grace and mercy. Welcome to another book club episode by your brothers in Christ, Nick and Peter, at the Guilt Grace Gratitude Podcast, where we bridge the gap to Reformed Christian theology for your listening pleasure. Today's book club episode, we are excited to have Dr. J. Gary Millar, and he'll be talking about his new book, new book, Changed into His Likeness, A Biblical Theology of Personal Transformation. It's within the New Studies in Biblical Theology series from IVP Academic. Before we kick off our questions and conversation with Dr. Millar, just remember after the show, check out our show notes. There's going to be a link to IVP's website for the book so you can purchase a copy for yourself. There's also a couple links for Reformed Church Finders to find a confessionally Reformed Church near you. And of course, a link to the Society of Reformed Podcasters to find other great podcasts out there. So again, I'll hand it off to Peter and he'll further introduce Dr. Millar. Yeah, we're super excited to have Dr. Millar. Uh, He's been principal of the Queensland Theological College since the start of 2012 studied chemistry in his home city of Belfast, moved to Aberdeen, Scotland, studied theology, completed his DPhil, which is kind of like a PhD at Oxford, on Deuteronomy, served as pastor for 17 years in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, and was involved in church revitalization and church planting before moving to Brisbane to lead the team at the Queensland Theological College. He's got a couple books, a couple commentaries, but we are super excited to have you on and talk about this book. Thanks for coming, Dr. Millar. Uh, it's good to be on. Great to talk to you guys. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, kind of breaking breaking the ice immediately. So, what was what was your background or influence behind writing this book, and especially so within this NSBT series? And what what contribution to understanding of sanctification or transformation were you trying to, or hopefully trying to make in this book? Um, I'm really a pastor at heart, and I think this this book had its um, had its genesis in a very pastoral issue. Um, two, there were two factors. One, um, here in Australia, uh, where I've lived for the past 10 years that we now call home, um, that there is a ten- there has been a tendency that has really flown out of a commitment to biblical theology accidentally, that because we've been so strong on biblical theology and so strong in preaching Christ in all the scriptures and Christ is the answer to everything and that God has given us all things in Christ. Accidentally, what that has led to over a kind of 20, 30 year year period is a disinterest in sanctification. And I started to hear some things that, that were just a little bit concerning and a little bit reductionist. I did hear someone once say, you know, the Christian life really is a matter of gritting our teeth and waiting for heaven. And, and I went, oh. <laughs> I, th- I think I'd like a little more than that. <laughs> and I, I think the scriptures hold out more than that. So that, that, was, that was rattling around in my head. And then I, I, I spoke at a the major student training conference here in Australia mm-hmm. on the theology of the Christian life, which then gave birth to a little book called Need to Know, which is just like a, a primer uh, trying to, to to give new Christians a really quick overview of the theological categories that will save a lot of pain and confusion later on. So introducing people early to the Trinity, to the to the sovereignty of God, to us being bound up in in the life of God, that that we should expect suffering, that how growth happens, and so on. And as it did that, you know, so that was a real labor of love and had been born again out of experience as a pastor in Dublin but when I was writing that book the one that one minute I didn't really feel like I nailed that I was very unhappy with was just a half page or page about how God actually changes us hmm. and so I thought oh I'd, I'd love the chance to, to actually think some more about that and particularly that was at the stage where questions of, of personal identity, you know, often arriving out of sex, you know, arising out of the whole sexuality debate was throwing up all kinds of questions about, mm. you know, who we are as human beings, you know, whether or not it's possible to change. And at that point, my good friends at Moore College in Sydney uh, asked me to give the annual Moore College lectures. And I thought, ah, oh, 
okay, here's a chance to force myself to do, <laughs> to do some thinking. And so that, that's, that's how it was born. So it really was born out of a desire to construct a, um, you know, in a way not to say anything particularly new, but yeah. just to have a fresh look at how we actually change, you know, that how the sanctification, what that sanctification process involves. So at one level, it's a book about sanctification, but I think by using that term, we tend to become, we tend to think purely in moral categories. So it's, it's simply about holiness. Yeah. You know, so it, it's like growth and sanctification is about not sinning in particular ways and, you know, perhaps growing, you know, in our ability to be more godly. And I just think, I think that deliberately wanted to use the, the language of personal transformation, hmm. because I think becoming more like the Lord Jesus, being renewed in Christ is actually a, it's a bigger category. Holiness hmm. is one way of describing it, but but I suspected that in the scriptures, it talks about talks about it as a much richer, multifaceted transformation than simply dealing with holiness language. So that's huh. that's how it was born. Yeah. And I think, <laughs> I think anything I write, I do tend to get to the end of it and think, well, there's another 250 page statement <laughs> of the obvious. <laughs> yeah. but, but but I'm always vaguely reassured uh, but by that. In a, in a in a strange way you know mm. that novel novelty can be overrated <laughs> yeah no that's good that's a helpful background yeah yeah thank thank you for that thank you for writing this book because you're mentioning that was something of a uh a gap in the bridge of understanding there in australia but i think it's definitely uh speaking as an american something that we need to understand here as well so could probably say the western world is definitely uh needing to be educated and reminded about what sanctification is and and this was this book was good and helpful as specifically diving into that in a deep way but not a not a way that can't be understood from the everyday person on the street the way you wrote it was very digestible for someone even like me um to to grasp so um when you what do you mean when you say changed into his likeness i'd love to hear from your words how you describe that and also this is very probably obvious to everyone whose likeness you're referring to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but i i i don't want to assume too much and make sure you cover that and how yeah. we are made how we are uh, actually created to conform to it yeah yeah, well, I think it's the controlling category of the book really is Christ likeness. Mm -hmm. You know that that God in restoring us after you know after um, Adam and Eve rebel against Him, that that God's unbroken commitment to make a people for Himself in His likeness who can enjoy Him forever, and those two things go together in the Scriptures. You know, being in the likeness of Christ and being enabled to enjoy life with the father through christ in the power of the spirit and um, that, that those two things are inseparable so christ likeness again it it is it isn't simply you know our moral transformation although it is that it it's the full restoration of, of all that our humanity was ever supposed to be hmm. and also because it is christ likeness there there is a sense in which we are made we are made like God. We are caught up into the family of God and made his people, you know, to enjoy life with the Trinity for, forever. So in that sense, it's, I just wanted to, I wanted to raise people's thinking, confidence, excitement about the work of God in our lives, because it is a complete restoration, rent, you know, renewal, renovation, whatever word you want to use it is, it is the full scope of God's work in our lives hmm. that begins um, when we come to Christ, when the Spirit is poured out, continues through this life, and then will reach, you know, its, its final fulfillment. You know, as John says, you know, wh when we see him as he is, for we are like him, that's the, that's the goal. And I think when, when we get that, certainly for me, it has the effect, it lifts our heads, you know, and, and goes, okay, I may feel a bit bumpy just now, but but that's the trajectory that we're on. 
in the mercy of God. And in that sense, it did what always wanted it to be a, a profoundly encouraging book um, for, for us as God's people, because it just opens our eyes a little wider to the scope of God's work. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, and I like how you titled the book Changed uh, changed into his likeness because that's really defining what sanctification is right and so yep. if you named it just sanctification people would be like i don't know what this what that means i don't know what this book's about so it's very <laughs> good that you define it even in the title and you know just for the audience too this has happened happens uh immediately after justification which we've talked to dr michael horton about on our show in the past so uh, we kind of know the the chain of events there. Um, you do start the book as, out asking three main questions. You say, you know, where do we come from? What are we? And where are we going? So without explaining the entire book, can you briefly <laughs> kind of give some context to each of these, to the, and an answer to each of these questions? Yeah. Um, the, the questions were originally asked by the painter Paul Gauguin, who was having a life crisis in the South Sea Islands and was, was starting to search for meaning. And there, there's a sense in which the questions that he asked well, about 150 years ago, that they, they just keep rattling around. You know, these are the questions that all human beings want the answer to. Um, and, and I think it's fair to say that at the moment, our answers are getting less adequate rather than more. Mm-hmm. Uh, people have weaker and weaker answers. So when, when we don't when we don't understand who we are, that we are creatures of God, you know that we when we don't when we don't begin there, well, in a way we're not going to get anywhere on on this journey. But but I think one of the things that resonated with me as I thought a little bit a little bit about those questions were was just the experience of Christians who kind of have come to Christ and believe they're justified but they're a bit stuck. Um, I think there are, I, I don't know what it's like for you guys in, in, in California just now, but, or Washington, California and Washington, but um, in Australia, I think a lot, of, a lot of Christians, they feel like they're on the back foot, you know, that, that we're, it feels like we're losing, mm. you know, and, and some things that were held dear in society are gradually drifting away and people yeah, are- Not too dissimilar from here. Yeah, and that and it just bleeds often into people's own experience of life with God or life in the church. And and so the the idea, I think, you know, we could write another we could have another d- discussion about, you know, the eschatological hope, you know, the the what what is being held out in front of us. But at a personal level, the idea that we are being changed and will be changed and will be like Christ, I think is a vital component to give people hope in the middle of the this mess and to also help them to, to discern what God is doing in us as individuals and in us as his people, you know, even through suffering, you know, even, even in the confusion that in God's incredible sovereignty, this is all bound up for a very distinct individual purpose as well as a global purpose. And, and for us, for us as the church, that purpose is together growing in, in the likeness of the Lord Jesus, which again, I think just reinforces, you know, the importance of the doctrine of the church yeah. and what we, should, what we should expect when we gather together as his people, when, you know, when we're supporting each other as we, as we live out the gospel kind of yeah. between gatherings. So hmm. maybe I kind of want to maybe dig further into a previous question. I just, one popped up was it's not so you're talking about how personal transformation is not just a kind of a moral project though it is that so when I think people usually think of transformation like oh I do better things or do things for my grandma or the person crossing the street or whatever it is when you say transformation and we're kind of seated in these heavenly realms like what what does that mean like maybe day to day for somebody who's thinking oh it's not just good things it's some like thinking thing how are this like like what should we think about this stuff yeah i think it's it's just being it's like every part of us being put right uh you know one of the things to do in the book is just step through the way in which the old testament talks about human beings you know and it's this rich picture it uses all sort of body parts to you know to capture what's going on in here um but it's so it's our thinking it's our reactions it's our emotions it's our instincts it's our commitments you know, it's the the way in which we look at the world. It's our conscience. 
it's the whole package being restored. Hmm. You know, so, so it isn't just actions. It's, mm -hmm. It is actions, but it's not just actions. You know, it's, it is our thinking is transformed. You know, really Romans 12, 1 and 2 is talking about that. But it's yeah. not just our thinking. It's actually the whole, it's the whole um, package of our humanity. And, you know, that, that's when we look at the Lord Jesus, that's, that's what we see. You know, we see this utterly unique expression of all that humanity was designed to be. Hmm. And, and it touches every part of his humanity. Hmm. Um, and, and I think that's the pattern for us, hmm. that it is this wholesale transformation, you know, that it, so that it, and I think that ultimately is a guard against legalism. Because hmm. when we see that that is, the, that is what the extent of God's work in our lives, it really does seem a bit, a bit ludicrous, <laughs> you know, <laughs> for us just to focus on ticking a few boxes here, here and there. Um, when really God is in the business of making us new. Um, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And I'd like to jump in to ask, since we're on the topic of the personal transformation part, and just this question is kind of based on hope being that it encourages the audience because sanctification is a, uh, could be a confusing term and how to, how to look at it. Is it something that people should look at as it happens to them in fullness in a vacuum, or is it more of a lifetime gradual process under God's sovereignty? How would you oh, describe that? Yeah, I, I think um, it, it is. This is where the, the New Testament does two things, and we have to hold on to both of them. That, that sometimes it uses the language of sanctif sanctification in a way that's exactly parallel to justification. You know, that it is talking about something that happens to us when we are united to Christ, that by virtue of his holiness, we, we too are made positionally or definitively holy. People use different language. Mm -hmm. So when you come to Christ, you are holy, which is why in the New Testament, you know, Paul, Peter, don't hesitate to, to talk about to the saints, the holy ones in Corinth, for example, that is a true statement because we've been made holy in Christ, but we've got to also cling on to this, you know, progressive idea that God transforms us over time. Now, one of the things that I think particularly struck me when I was writing the book is that the way in which in the New Testament, that's, that that process is expected to be painful, to be bumpy, inconsistent, that that process takes place in the context of suffering. And, and as always, that's both suffering that we, we share simply because we are part of sinful humanity living in a sinful world, but also the specific suffering that we face as the people of God who are caught up in the great conflict of Psalm 2 you know, and uh, the rest of the Bible between kind of Satan and the Messiah. So, so our growth, it, we are actually, you know, Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, which I think in the sweep of the New Testament is bind up into God's transformative uh, project. This trouble has an end because of the sovereignty of God. And in his kindness, one part of that, that end, that goal is that individuals like us, that the church will be purified and made more like the Lord Jesus. I think the, the other thing is that sanctification is almost always talked about in a relational sense, you know, that we are, we are sanctified in the church. And I think often we, you know, in evangelicalism more broadly, you know, I think we slip into to acting as if sort of sanctification is just what happens when we sit on our own in a quiet room with the Bible. And of course, God speaks into our lives to make us more holy, but often where that process plays out is in relationship with our brothers and sisters. And, and it's, it is quite striking when, when you read the New Testament looking for that. You know, where does change occur in relationship? And it, it's, it's kind of everywhere, you know, especially in the epistles. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the de why, why do we get so much detail about people's relationships, it's partly because it is in seeking to live for Christ in those relationships that we grow. Because it's it's obvious that during our sanctification, we're still sinning, but we're not 
we're, we shouldn't be cuddling up or being friends to sin. So we're feeling almost the Holy Spirit tearing away and we're feeling more convicted of our sin. And um, that could be a form of suffering, I guess, too, because we're, we're not feeling like we're part of this world. Also, on the other then, end, it's thankful that it's sanctification is more of a progressive thing because we all know progress uh, confessing Christians out there that we would have a hard time saying they were holy. <laughs> yeah. so, some people yeah. out there that we know that were like, yeah, well, so, um, it, you know, it's a process. So, and, yeah. and talking about that, we talked about personal transformation just now. What about biblical anthropology that you talk about in the book? Yeah, I mean, I think I, m it's more important at the moment than ever just to, to be really clear on what we think a person is. Mm -hmm. you no, know, and there's a lot of discussion out there. And for me, one of the for me one of the fun parts of the book, you know, like I, I I'm a chemistry major. You know, I I don't, <laughs> don't know much about psychology, but I did I did get to spend a couple of months. <laughs> trying to you know read what people say about who we are as human beings and and um how change happens and i was i was slightly amused and relieved um to read all these you know psychology papers and and books and come to the conclusion they don't really know how change happens <laughs> yeah um, nor is there actually much agreement on on the nature of humanity so I went back and, you know, Old Testament's kind of my, my kind of field. And I spent some time looking again at what the Bible actually says about us as human beings. And it's interesting because all the way through the Bible, we have this, this tension where we, we are both, um, we are both units. Like I, we are a complete being, we are a person. And, and, half of the time the bible speaks about it as speaks us speaks to us as unified beings but then we are also beings you know who who have a a physical part and another part yeah you know which will go on after us yeah yeah you know, so um there's a lot of discussion in the the kind of contemporary literature about this you know but it's this we are both kind of singular and dualistic and the Bible moves really easily between, between each of them. Yeah. Um, but there's a sense in which we just, we need to think a little bit about that. You know, we are creatures made in the image of God and I wouldn't want to press the analogy, but in the same way that in, you know, in, in the Godhead, there is both kind of singularity and plurality in a way as human beings, we're like that, you know, there is a, there is singularity and a plurality in mm -hmm. human beings. Yeah. Um, but where where the Bible is very clear is that there is a a marked contrast in the way in which God the, our physical bodies track, you know, which you know, it's, <laughs> uh, uh, and the way in which we as people before God track, yeah, which is. You know, certainly the trend of the graph is up, although the graph is a, is a little bumpy as we go. Yeah, yeah that's uh, I think that kind of helpfully moves along because you, you talk about character studies and I think as Reformed Christians and people who like expositional Bible studies and expositional sermons, we're like, oh, character studies, this is bad stuff. We don't want to just talk about, oh, David, but why, like, yeah. why, why focus on character studies as it relates to our personal transformation? Yep. Uh, um. I, I think, I mean, like you, I, I suspect I've come in the similar kind of journey. You know, I yeah. grew up in Sunday school with character studies where, you know, it seemed like the message of every week was, you know, be more like Abraham. You yeah. know? Although presumably it wasn't talking about the second half of Genesis 12. When, when <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, be more like Abraham, be more like Moses. And then kind of discovered that, you know, the whole, you know, all the scriptures point to Christ. So then we go, okay, character studies are bad. You know, so yeah. we're not doing that. And it's all about Jesus. And if we're not careful, you know, we actually kind of don't give credence to the fact that large tracts of the Old Testament are devoted to the events of people's lives. Yeah. You know, and I always had a sense of disquiet because for me, it was the Joseph narrative always made me uncomfortable because it was so long. And, it, you know, and, 
And there, there is a sense in Genesis that the Joseph narrative is really driving to Genesis 49 and the primacy of the line of Judah. And mm-hmm. you, you know, you got, you intended it for harm, but God intended it for good. I could do that. But, but the fact is you've still got Genesis 37 to 50. <laughs> yeah. you know, so what, what do you do with your 13 week series on Joseph? You know, when the punchline <laughs> comes in the last week and you didn't yeah. really say anything about Joseph in between. So, so that, that, that just, in the context of this project, I just spent some more time thinking about this. I'm going, well, is it possible that part of the function of these narratives, it, it, it is, in a way, it is a character study, but it's, it's clearly not holding these people up as examples. Yeah. But it might be telling us something about ourselves. Huh. And so then I went back and I kind of look, you know, looked again at all the great characters of the, of the Old Testament. And it, and it actually started, I was doing some work in the Book of Kings um, a few years ago, and I, not, I noticed that really the only three good kings in the Books of Kings, you know, kind of Solomon, Hezekiah, and Josiah all end really badly. Hmm. I mean, Josiah is the best, but even then, I mean, Josiah's death is kind of stupid and pointless. <laughs> you know, from a very godly king, he gets involved in a fight that he had nothing to do with him and he couldn't win. You know, and it does leave you with a, uh, you know, a sense of disappointment. Yeah. And, and then, uh, you know, I realized, well, you know, you've got that, you've got the same pattern with Noah, hmm. you know, that horrible, you know, when Noah comes out of the ark in Genesis 9 and 10, and then I started, I looked at Abraham and, and I think that this, the little thing that kind of pushed me over the edge to say, oh, well, this is, there's something in this is when you, when you look right at the end of the story of Abraham tucked away there's this little mention of the fact that he'd other pagan wives hmm. uh you know that he'd all that you know he'd, he'd, he'd done the concubine thing with it <laughs> yeah. he actually did it again yeah you know whoa where did where did that come from and then you know second uh the first two chapters second kings chapters one and two sorry first kings one and two the end of david yeah you know that david ends up you know that's with abishai the um uh, you know in in the bed keeping his feet warm um, yeah, yeah. despite no no this is not this is not the david of david and goliath you know this is this is sad and even he tells solomon then to go and kill his enemies yeah you know? and and so i started to, to just kind of went right through all these characters go whoa n- they all basically they all end badly or yeah. i mean that daniel doesn't end badly we get it but we don't actually get much about Daniel. Daniel's consistent. Yep. Yeah. And, and it's just realized, well, you know what? There, there is no sign or even, tran- even expectation of transformation in the Old Testament. Hmm. Um, and I think we've got to be very careful about arguments from silence. Yeah. But when you come to New Covenant passages like Deuteronomy 30 or Jeremiah 31 or you know, Ezekiel 36, 37, 38, there is there's a dramatic expectation of change in the future on the other side of the on the other side of the gift of the spirit I, and then that then sent me to the new testament and and when you get to the new testament the language the images the metaphors that are used for change and growth are just everywhere hmm. and and they're just not there in the they're not there in the old testament hmm. Yes, you're not using character studies necessarily to lift up these characters, but you're saying that there's, in some passages, there's this hope for transformation that just doesn't happen to some of these people. And I'm not lifting these people up as examples, but like something's coming to transform us. And I think there, you know, I mean, I I want to take what Paul says in 1 Corinthians seriously, you know, like these things happen to them, but they were written for us. Yeah. You know, so there is actual theological value in across the richness of the narrative and of course ultimately you know all of these narratives all of these these stories are driving us towards christ absolutely but how are they doing that yeah well sometimes in the detail what they're doing is saying like really this is all these guys of god (laughs) you know they're they're clinging to god you know ultimately looking ahead to christ by faith And, and then that to me starts to make sense of of some you know like, for example, Jesus' statement about, you know, even the least in the kingdom of heaven hmm. is greater than John the Baptist. You know, that, yeah. that there is a marked 
difference in our experience, you know, that in, you know, in this sort of administration of the covenant of grace, it's very different to the way it was before, before Christ's death, resurrection, and the outpouring of the spirit. Yeah, I mean, maybe just to cap it off, it's almost almost like the the silence is crying out for like something changed this, that this, oh, this yeah. terribleness that we're like yeah. these random deaths, these weird things that happen, something needs to come and change this. Even though oh, it's not and, saying it directly, it's almost almost yeah, like crying oh, out for that. And I think I think for me, one of the clearest examples of that comes at the end of Nehemiah. You yeah. know, like Nehemiah 13, you know, which I love the fact that we have a Bible that has Nehemiah 13 in it. <laughs> you know, when he goes, when he goes, hey, that's where he goes back to the city and, you know, they've given Tobiah one of his, you know, his nemesis, an apartment in the temple complex. So he throws all this furniture out the window and then he throws some punches and he pulls some people's hair because they're not teaching their kids <laughs> Hebrew and, you know, and yeah. getting on the Sabbath. And then it's the way the book ends and he just, he just says, oh, remember me, God, for my good. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. I built my wall. But nothing has changed. I've got huh. nothing, you know, yeah. and it is that. I, I and if you, if you read that, I think in the light of his 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 epic prayer in chapter nine, where where he is saying, "God, please come through in your covenant promises." That, that you get to the end of the book, and that's really all he's got. Yeah. But what is what is at the heart of the promises of the the covenant? Well, you know, I will be your God. You'll be my people. But it's only when Christ comes that we realize that for that to be the case, hmm. we need Jesus to be the covenant mediator. We need Jesus to pour out the spirit on us. We need to be remade in the image of Jesus. Hmm. You know? So there's, there's always that sense of, of just of, uh, reaching for something that's, that's, that's just, beyond our, <laughs> just beyond our reach through, yeah. through the Old Testament. Hmm. So in the, in the theme of transformation into Christ likeness, we've yep. talked about the role of the Holy Spirit briefly. We've touched about that. And then of course we talked about Jesus's role in transforming us to his likeness, but to tie it all together in the terms of the, of the Trinity, how did the father, how did and does the father, son, and spirit all work together as far as the Trinity, when it comes to this topic of changing into Christ likeness, yeah, yeah, oh, that that's that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think at its simplest, you know, that th this has always been the Father's intention. You know, I, I think we do we do always have a tendency to revert to a kind of Plan B mentality. <laughs> yeah, you know, which, which just isn't true. You know that what that 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 I think the potentiality that was in humanity when we were created, you know, is ultimately realized kind of on this, in this side of the work of Christ, but the, the father is the one who is directing this operation that when Jesus comes and Jesus, you you know, you unites, you know, humanity and, and divinity in his person, and he comes fully man, fully God. On the one end, we see what, perfect humanity looks like uh, we also see that when we uh, when we are united to him that there is a sense in which that through this union with christ that 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 our the renovation of our personality of our humanity is is begun through his power but it is actually i think the work of the spirit to apply that to us to bring about that transformation, which again, the New Testament speaks about in multiple ways. Like for example, what is the fruit of the spirit? The fruit of the spirit is essentially, it's, a, it's, it's one thing, you know, it's a, it's a singular with you know, nine elements. It's essentially a description of Christ-likeness. So the spirit uses, oft, uses ordinary means, you know, uses the word, you know, primarily, and then, as we seek to live out the word in the brokenness of life, in the context of the church, the spirit continues that work in us to, to make us, remake us in the pattern which we have seen in the Lord Jesus, the one to whom we are joined, that we might live to the glory of the Father. Mm. Yeah, that's good. 
And as far as I imagine, when people read this book and hear this interview, it's going to hopefully point them to the great book, the, the Bible, and finding actual scripture that you tie this in together. Is there yeah. any certain verses that you could say which really you kind of hung your hat on with this book that could point us to the Bible to, to refer uh, to. I, I think, I think for me that the obvious, the obvious place um, to go to is actually second Corinthians three to five. Mm -hmm. um, where, where, where Paul is, is really reflecting on Moses experience on Sinai and using that as a, as a gateway to understand this work of transformation. Um, you know, so we are, he says, you know, we are transformed from one degree of glory into another, you know, which, which is, I think, capturing that sanctification, you know, that we are already made holy, but the work is not finished. Where, where Paul says, you know, what Moses saw, you know, and Moses' face, his actual face was transformed that our experience through the gospel, you know, and we have this treasure in jars of clay, that is actually, you're ramping up what Moses experienced. So as individual Christians, you know, I think it's easy to look at Moses and go, well, you know, wouldn't it have been great if you got to go up the mountain and talk to God? And, and Paul's not having any of that. <laughs> Paul's <laughs> saying the work of the gospel is actually pardon me, amplified that, intensified that, mm. and that is what is happening with you, that this transformative gospel has been embedded deeply in you. It, is, it opens your eyes, it shows you glory, and it ultimately transforms us. You know, and these light and momentary afflictions are achieving for us a weight of glory, a kind of tonnage of glory beyond what we can imagine so that, that for me that is the that that would be the go-to place mm. so yeah that's good that's even, yeah. you might even say i even if you see it in the background you see i oh yeah I, there's a jar of clay I, yep. I don't i don't know i don't have many relics you know but this is <laughs> uh, i do I, I do have a first century jar of clay so <laughs> i like it you could listen to the christian rock group jars of clay too <laughs> <laughs> That that actually that I think that leads me pretty well to our last last couple of questions. So as they're drawing from scripture, you you draw heavily from some reformed or neo-reformed theologians. So how do these theologians, Calvin, Luther, all these guys, how, how do they help us understand our own transformation? Oh, uh, I, I mean, again, this was, I mean, I'm really a biblical studies guy, you know, I'm a, a Bible guy. So it yeah. was great fun for me to actually. Uh, stand on the shoulders of a random collection of people who thought about this yeah and and when i actually look it's interesting of course every you know everybody will touch on it but just trying to find some people who had thought serious and really engaged with this and how we how we are changed and one of the things that struck me is that kind of starting with the gospel you know some of some of these people are you know our kind of usual friends, you know, yeah. like Calvin, Augustine, you know, whatever. Some others, you know, Aquinas. Huh. Um, it's actually quite close to Calvin. Yeah. You know, some people, I mean, uh, I know he's, he's, you know, my fellow Northern Irishman, C.S. Lewis, much loved by American, yeah. <laughs> Americans. Yeah. Uh, Lewis has some things to say. Uh, one of my favorites is actually John Newton, huh. uh, the yeah. writer of Amazing Grace, because, you know, Newton never, never really, never wrote a book. But he did write a lot of letters. Yeah. And in a couple of these letters, he articulates kind of what we're talking about, progressive sanctification beautifully. But but the, the overall, you know, as I looked at these kind of 11, 12, 13 theologians or movements, including some biblical counseling guys more recently, what the striking thing was that what people tend to do is take one element, one, one um, feature of change. You know, so Jonathan Edwards obviously deals with the transformation of our affections in a great and powerful way. But then someone else will come along and 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 frame the whole discussion quite differently. Um, and you know, and and I think for me that the, the uh, Warfield, for example, wrote quite movingly about miserable sinner Christianity hmm. um, and the power of recognizing our own sinfulness as we look to Christ to renovate us, to restore us. So one of the things that I realized was that 
looking across all these great writers that the subject of our transformation is so big that that we need all the help we can get and that these individual writers do tend to shine a light on one little aspect which may be you know hugely encouraging helpful um but isn't the whole story hmm. you know? um because because it is such a the story of God's transformation of people like us into the likeness of Christ is a massive thing. Yeah. So, you know, that's where, yeah, that's... I think in, the, in those, you know, in that section of the book, I, I mean, I've just pointed to a lot of helpful things that I've seen, mm. but, but it almost kind of, to me, it almost sort of justified the project. Yeah. Because I couldn't find anyone who really tried to put all those things together. Huh. So I just took everybody else's good ideas and you know, <laughs> made them your own. The book. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Um, and you touched on this kind of a last question before I wrap up. So you, you touched on this a little bit. So at the end, you write on the errors of an underrealized and an overrealized eschatology in yeah. relation to our transformation. Can you define these two things yeah. and explain like how people, if, if they fall into this or fall into that, they kind of understand our transformation? And what you describe is maybe a help, more helpful way of describing how we're transformed. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think you know the underrealized eschatology. That's that's um, kind of acting like heaven doesn't really break into earth at all. You know, so we're kind of on our own, and mm. we just muddle along with gritted teeth, as I mentioned. You know, we read the Bible, say our prayers, go to church, but we don't really expect anything. And then, you know, eventually Jesus will return or we'll go to be with him and he'll, you know, he'll do the business. He'll sort mm -hmm. it all out. The problem with that is what, what that just leads us to the point where we get up in the morning and there isn't actually any imperative, any expe expectation to get up in the morning and say, you know, Christ is in, is in me. The, you know, the gospel is all I need. He's given me everything I need for life and godliness. I, I, I can throw myself in the living wholeheartedly for him today. At the end of the day, sure, I'll need to repent and take hold of Christ again, you know, but, but the, the trend is up here, hmm. you know, that I can expect to see, you know, progress. Um, I, you know, the, the overrealized eschatology, there are all kinds of examples of that, but, you know, in the prosperity movement, in some forms of charismatic Christianity, where really you expect heaven on earth, we get it all. You know, so promises of health and wealth, you know, that sickness will be banished, that there'll be you know, miracles every day, you know, that which doesn't actually fit with what the Bible says about yeah. our expectation of life. So they're asked, they, you know, it's like no heaven, no heaven at all or all heaven now. Hmm. And again, you know, this is where to me, this is it's just biblical Christianity to say there is joy, but there is joy in the midst of suffering. You know, there is, you know, there is obedience, but there is also repent, you know, there is also a need for repentance, you know, to me, I mean, this is, I've just spent the last couple of days examining some of our final year students on the, on the Westminster Confession, mm -hmm. you know, and it's the kind of thing that the framers of the confessions, I think, spent most of the, probably about half the six years on trying to get this biblical balance mm -hmm. in writing about the Christian life. So there is assurance, but, you know, it can be a bit shaky. You know, so that there is progress, but there's not perfection. So that we are forgiven, but God in his mercy will continue to forgive us in real time. You know, so it's that that's what I'm talking about. And in that sense, you know, I mean, I'm not just being modest here. You know, I think that this really what I've tried to do is articulate in the fullest way that I was capable of, you know, biblical doctrine of sanctification, transformation in a way that enables us to live the Christian life. Um, in, in, in a way that's faithful and biblical, realistic, and above all, true to the scriptures, you know, that we might delight in Christ and serve him, realizing that we are still sinful people who live in repentance and faith. Yeah, thank you so much for reminding us of that and bringing that up. And speaking of assurance, I wanted to just clarify to ask, and I know with justification, as Dr. Horton let us know, we can't lose that. That's a gift and it's permanent. So with sanctification, is that, um, could you clarify that for the audience on assurance for it? Can we lose it or no? Can we lose? Say our sanctification. Um, 
uh, no, but but it, its progress is not always easy to chart def definitively. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a long term project. I think I would say, I would say that if you're you know if you're following Christ, you should always be able to see some shoots of growth, some encouragement, some little progress, and. And remember that in this, you know, we do need to think as the church, you know, that there will be days where I'm going, oh, what a disaster. You know, I'm getting worse rather than better. That if I spoke to my closest friends, if I spoke to, you know, you know other elders in church, they, they would say, seriously, <laughs> Gary, I think you need to remember what you were like five years ago <laughs> or don't, don't, don't you remember that God has been doing this and this and this and this in your life? Hmm. So the point, uh, the point of attack or the point of struggle may have changed. And I think we often forget areas where we have grown or, or, or not be aware of places we've been softened or new things we've learned or new delights we've had. You know, so I don't want to say that at this moment, every, you know, you should be able to, to you know, speak eloquently about the dramatic ways in which you're growing in holiness, you know, or, or have been over the past two weeks. But I think when we step back and examine the course of our lives, I, I think God in his kindness ensures that there are always places where we can see that our, even simply our grasp on God's faithfulness is a little greater than it was before. Um, yeah. <clears throat> that's, that's a, uh... That's so how this has been a, a really cool conversation. So I wanted to bring people to, if you have anything else upcoming after this, if they're reading this, like, oh, he's helping me understand my transformation a little bit better. I want to I read more of Dr. Millard. Does he have anything coming up in the future? Uh, I'm, I'm writing a commentary on Deuteronomy. Okay. That needs to be finished by the end of the year. I should, <laughs> should look out for that. And actually, <laughs> I, I actually, I just got this. I have this set up. There's a, a little book coming out next year called read this first huh which which is uh that's that's like an ikea ripoff kind of catalog <laughs> yeah. um but it's basically um we just i just realized there are a lot of people certainly in our context who have never opened the bible don't have a clue they haven't had a bad experience of church they've had no experience of church huh. and it it's just a very it's a jargon free guide to biblical interpretation that you can give to someone who's just starting to read the bible that will help them get into reading the bible itself with just you know a little bit of guidance so that they're not just completely lost so hmm. yeah so a bit different but yeah um, <laughs> i think i've got a short attention span <laughs> that's good no i like it yeah we'll, we'll have to We'll have to have you back on to talk about that book and and yeah it's been it's been a great conversation thanks for coming on this has been this has been fantastic it's been great to meet you guys uh it really it's been it's been good fun thank you